a music track called um, Pineapple Princess, which I thought fitted very well with our picnic theme, and that's by the Kill Isles. So that's um, her, um, her McKeel's Auckland band, and then I think that's a late 60s album. So I'll post that, but you'll like cool. the Pineapple Princess. Yay! Where are Pineapple from? Princess. Where are they from? Hawaii? No, oh, and- that's a plantation. I used to live next door to that plantation. Scott. <laughs> I didn't have any pineapples. <laughs> I just looked at them every day. Pineapple princess, he calls me pineapple princess all day as he plays ukulele on the hill above the bay. Pineapple princess, I love you, you're the sweetest girl. Kia ora, this next little section uh, features more talk about representation, including a little bit of chit-chat from our last episode recordings. Um, also, we discuss museums, uh, moai from Rapa Nui, and uh, Pacifica ways of thinking around objects, uh, taonga, tauka. Enjoy! Uh, finally, the American Natural History Museum. Um, made famous in Friends because that's the one that um, Ross worked at. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, when you're actually very close to that really famous diorama that Rachel and Ross wake up in. Oh, was that what you posted? That yeah. was amazing. Yeah, so really close to that diorama is one of the indigenous Manhattan people meeting the Dutch. <gasps> Tai hoa e hoa. can you just um, explain a diorama? Oh, well, you know it when you see it. So it's yeah, is it, it like cutouts? No, That's what no, I thought great, of great, great question. So everyone will know one when they see one because we made them when we were at yeah, primary school. That's what I was just thinking. It's a wee box with a three-dimensional scene. Scene, <gasps> yeah, <gasps> that tells a story. It's a moment in history, but of course that's heavily hung up with who's telling the story. What's been left out? Mm. What's been put in there that doesn't belong there? You've seen it in that movie, the a museum one that comes alive. What's mm. those movies? <laughs> Night at the Museum. Night at the Museum. Those are all dioramas. Fun fact. <laughs> Night at the Museum. <laughs> yeah. The Smithsonian. Okay, so the Smithsonian is the biggest museum in the world over several buildings. The biggest museum in the world in one building is the Kremlin. Fun fact. You know how there's a moai in Night at the Museum. <laughs> They don't have one. Ha! British Museum does. So does the Otago Museum. Oh. Yes, do you know what? At the end of that article, so there's this wonderful article about um, repatriation of the Moai, mm. um, and it had um, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Yeah. So when we got our oh. one in Otago Museum, it was one of only eight off Rapa Nui at the time. Whoa. So it's very, very special. It's a good time to actually talk about... Um, Sacredness of, um, since we were talking about the moai, mm. and sacredness of objects, mm. taonga, treasures. Mm. So there's that concept of... Why? Modi and um, mana. Yeah, so let's pull that apart. Modi, so we use the same word, life force, modi. It's really hard to translate into That's interesting, into, isn't it? Into English, though, We're so like cousins. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, for example, the Moai at Otago Museum. Mm. We love you. We went to mm. visit the Did other you? day. Yeah. Yeah, we went and, to visit. Well, we went to see the women's exhibition. Because it was the very last day. So yeah. I had to, had to take yeah, my yeah, sister. Yeah. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. But you oh, were having well. parties. We were there for you. Because yeah. you were celebrating, oh, right. you were celebrating your son's twenty first. So yeah, that was, was very awesome. special. You couldn't. Ever. Oh, that's awesome. So that's why we were there. So we went to visit Moai. I tell you what, just being in that Moai's presence, mm. I immediately wanted to cry. Mm. There is something else going on there, <laughs> you know. Mm. And I'm, I'll be the first to acknowledge because that's how I grew up. Mm. It's like if you feel something, there's a reason. Mm. Yep. We went back Did the you? other night. Did you? Said hello. Much happier. Really? <laughs> That's the thing yeah. about, and I think that New Zealand museums have done a lot of work in the last few years to move towards acknowledging that, that objects need to be objects. 
Tauka need to be acknowledged. Objects need to be acknowledged as being tauka, and tauka need to be kept um, yeah. warm. Yeah. So visiting them and using them and um, touching them in a way that's not going to um, introduce some kind of rapid onset of decomposition, you know. We need to we need to be respectful of that, I think, because especially but just being in the energy of it. That's right. Is in, yeah. I mean, we don't have to we don't have to physically touch it. We can spiritually touch mm. it, and that's I guess um, the kind of the difference. And so, like for me, you know, I really like I've spent a lot of time in museums this year, and in Europe and England and Scotland and Ireland, <laughs> and um, the you know. The idea of a file that's associated with a catalogue number that's associated with the object, it's all very clinical and it's all very mm. scientific. What I'd really love to see, and this includes Otago Museum, is those items acknowledged as with to do with the context behind what that item is. The provenance. Where, not the provenance, because I think the provenance from a um, non-Indigenous perspective mm. is generally who bought it yeah. or who donated it. So for us, it's more like, okay, what area did that come from? Who were the people? What did they use it for? What was the spiritual significance? Yeah. All of that kind of context to be involved in the description of it. So there's one museum that I went to this year that actually did that quite well. And that was Pitt Rivers oh. in Oxford. And it's I think one of the reasons is because it's an academic museum. It's ground zero. Yeah. It's the beginning of museum and so, collecting. But the funny thing is, so like everything looks really clinical in there. I'll yeah. post a picture because I've got a few postcards of the place. Yeah. Um, and it's all like the old school boxes with things in it. But then next to the things were the best descriptions of anything that I saw in all the museums that I went to, partly because they recognised the people. Yeah. I wonder like if the specific person and who <clears throat> that was. I wonder if having been visited by so many people like I yourself. I think it's a lot to do with it. That stood have actually there and helped. said, yeah, that's actually, meaningless, why don't you tell this story? This is what this is about. And that's yeah. what I feel when I see the more. I'm just like, we are nowhere near where this object came from why are you here and that's why I felt so what sad what brings you here as opposed to it was a out of this collection from the mm. state I mean this, this means no why are you here for me why he feels lonely you? why are you still here he feels lonely yeah mm. he's separated from his people yeah mm. and that's the difference right it's like immediately if I see things that are really tapu for us in a museum I grieve I can't not because mm -hmm. for us it is not an object. It is a connection to our ancestors and who we are. Mm. And and it it doesn't teach anything. That's right. And that's, that's teaches, the thing that here's a box, here, here's a, <laughs> here's, a thing. Here's, here's a museum <laughs> where objects sit mm -hmm. and this object has the basic data around it, but it doesn't actually teach people going in. The connection, and I to think people mm. just from this four sentences. No, the argument that the British Museum is got going on is, is <laughs> like you know we have to hang on to these because these many million people have access to viewing and hearing the story. But the but reality if not is, those people. The story properly, but also not only that. Often those Indigenous peoples can't even access that stuff. Come on, yeah. Like who can travel? Mm. Who has the money to get to those places? That's right. Yeah. So the British Museum's argument is is that all of these English and European people have access to that culture. So they, their argument for hanging on to the Elgin marbles and all these other objects that um, should be returned is that no, no. Here, here they get better exposure. But also there's that 1963 law. Yeah, there is. With um, they can't repatriate, but they can in exceptional circumstances, like or um, Rapa Nui have a few sacred objects. Oh, back. sacred for Maori. Like yeah. there was actually a, a repatriation that happened it's across human several remains. human remains mm. across several museums. I think there's about six involved. Was it two years ago? And I feel in, for objects 
of cultural significance, and I'm not talking about science, I'm talking about arts and culture, that there needs to be that is such an old way of looking at mm. it's objectifying um, objectifying mm. and and it's not our world view is kind of what I'm trying to say yeah. here is there's yeah. a difference in world view and that's the real mm. problem that's the that's the friction is between these two, two different ways of looking at things and I'm not saying that the scientific cataloging and you know who gave it to the museum or who, who, or how long it is, or how big mm. it is, or all of that stuff isn't useful information. What I'm saying is that there's no connection back to the people mm. that that was important to, and that in itself, I mean, it, it's it's like this, um, it's like everything's removed from the people mm. and, and who they were mm. and, and why it was important and humanising. Is it enhancing the mana of the taoka? Because ultimately when you takoha something, when you loan it to somebody else, when you uh, say f- when two whakapapa are merged in a marriage and you know an, a significantly important, for example, metaponamu goes across to the other family and the other family look after it for a while. That a while might be decades. Mm-hmm. But it's not theirs to keep. It's theirs to cherish and also in being amongst the other whanau, the other hapu, the people who have um, consented to the loan are acknowledging that they feel that the other people are people of mana and that the tauka hanging out with them for a while will, will increase the mana of the tauka. Mm. Am I making sense? Yes. Mm. What what we are doing is we're treating the object, the taoka, as a subject, not an object. That it has the ability to accrue good energy for mm. it to be. If it's surround, if it does good deeds, if it's is surrounded by other entities with good energy, then that energy will be absorbed. And the same same with. Um, but mana's more active. Mana's about doing things. Mm. Um, but you're born with mana as well, especially if you have come from a whakapapa a, a of people who've done useful and or amazing things. So if you are um, born into the kingitanga line, you're born with massive mana, so you, your expectation to step up to that is more intense than if you were born into, you know... Not yeah. a thingy tongue mm. line. So, mm. uh, just mm. as a way of describing this responsibility, it. it's responsibility, yeah. sure. In Modi, it's less um, active. It's more about everything has Modi, but Modi can grow. You mm. can, you can, and, and it can be positive and negative too. So, if you hang out with stink people, you're going to get their stink Modi off them. Mm. Mm. Um, and then there's Wairua, a whole nother thing. Yeah, so Wairua is real. I see it as kind of like being layers of, you know, how like an, um, an atom has. Mm. Valencies of energy, yep. mm. and you don't. The electrons aren't actually ever in those layers. But it's just a theory. The more we find out about it, with more and more technology and more and more study, is that you know the electrons are just kind of everywhere at once, and in no place ever, which is a bit of a. Um, a That's a mind blow. Yeah, right. it really is. Yeah. So I see mana and modi and waidoa as being kind of like those layers, everywhere yeah. all at once. What I like about that too is that what you're really talking about is a holistic view Mm. as well. So all of these cultures that Mm. we're discussing have a holistic view. So we're not – you can't remove one thing and talk about that one thing in – by itself Mm. or compartmentalise. We do this with the human body and um, we'll go, oh, I've got a sore arm. Forget all the stuff we were doing with the mm. shoulder and stuff and the neck and the arm and all the the extended... It's always like we go to that little thing, right? So I'm basically saying with objects, and you are too, with the way that you're talking about Māori and wairua, is that there is this, there's all these other layers of connection and connectivity mm. and a holistic way of looking at that item. I, mm. I think... For me, I think people get it if you're talking about art. So if you see a painting, you know, you know, there's the whole story of who painted that, 
and what they were thinking of at that time and what led them their whole life yeah. to paint that painting at that particular time and space. And so when you're looking at art, I think the art world kind of like gets... You know, but also it's, it's not it's just about that, that person, travel. it's also about right. you and your yeah. view and yeah. the other people in the room and their views. And me looking at it. So it's collective, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's um, holistic. It's it's mm. covering all time. <laughs> but like um, at the Otago Museum there's lots of feasting bowls. and But you don't get... The idea of what that was actually for. It, yeah. Why? Or so we. Someone was born. Quite a lot of Hooray, let's feast. Solomon Whoa, Island. Died. Hooray, let's feast. Well, or, you there's know, several Solomon a, Island feasting yeah. bowls in there. Are you allowed to use that? And so you? we had yep. Lou's kids were there, and they're like, "Oh, what's that for?" And I was like, "Oh, right." So we would, for our big feast, like the the bowls they had in there were probably about I don't know about that big, but the ones that we traditionally have had in the past, you know, massive and like deep. And it was to prep our food in to be able to like make copious amounts for the village. Lots of people. When they were doing like it might be a nut cracking festival. It's typical in my area. So with that the sounds nut. like fun. Yeah. So these nuts would only be ready once a year. Three days of cracking. There's massive piles of nuts mm. together as a village. Yep. And then at the end of that to celebrate the the collecting of the nut because they're collecting their massive really tall trees as well so you when I say tall they're like the top of the forest like you have to climb I've filmed a few years ago I filmed one of my uncles climbing and cool. and the whole entire ceremony from like the actual collecting to the cracking that to the music sense. that went with it yeah. and then we finished mm. with the feast so and then we'd eat together because we'd all just worked really hard together what's the nut and what does it taste Nully like nut and it's a canary al- almond and it's delicious. It is the nut. So do they get stored so that they are still quite meaty or do they get dried? Generally, oh, they can be stored. Just eat them all at once? Yeah, we just, everyone has, it's like mango. Oh, so you, <laughs> it's like seasonal. Yeah, mango season and then everyone goes crazy on mango and then no one can eat it again. Yeah. Oh. And then we all like wait for like half a year for Not it to come around again. again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could have saw belly. Yeah. Pineapple, pineapple's the same. I uh, can't move my mouth because I burnt it's, it. Oh, yeah. It's too many pineapple pieces. Hi, am I? Everything is got pie. You're here at last. You're really here at last.